Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Gina Turner and Melissa and Peg and the team at the Humanity Center for hosting me, getting me here, getting all of you out on a beautiful sunny evening. I understand you haven't seen it a lot lately, so I'm happy I could bring some sunshine your way. Um, I'm here to talk with you about this moment that we're in. I, I would call it a, a, a moment of extreme, extraordinary inequality of income, wealth, and opportunity, and, and what it means and, and what we can do to reverse it. Um, but I want to say, I think that a, the, the discussion about inequality sometimes can be polarized, stuck, um, and that I, and, and even raising the question of, you know, is there a concentration of wealth in this country uh, elicits concerns or that, you know, I'm going to come out and talk about class warfare, class envy. Um, so let me start by just saying, you know, I, I, I grew up in the 1%. Uh, my great grandfather was the meatpacker Oscar Meyer. Uh, so my dad used to say, bringing home the bacon means something different in our family. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, you know, uh, still go to our big family reunion where, you know, I put on my lederhosen and uh, stand in front of with uh, a group family picture in front of the Wienermobile with, you know, 350 of my closest relatives. So we're uh, still a very, very close-knit family. Uh, and, but I, I say that because I, I, I want you to know I grew up in a bubble of privilege. I grew up in uh, a wealthy suburb of Detroit, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Uh, I went to a, a boys prep school, Cranbrook School. Um, our school motto was aim high, which is depicted by an archer shooting an arrow straight into the air, <laughs> which if you think about it, <laughs> says it all. Uh, one of my older classmates was a guy named Mitt Romney, and uh, he certainly aimed high, I thought, uh, in terms of his aspirations. Um, but, you know, that, that whole socialization, that experience was, you know, to prepare me as a young man born on third base. I'd won the lottery at birth, and I'm going to be prepared to take my place at the head of the table. Um, and that was really the socialization that I grew up with, uh, except for a couple of things. One was uh, uh, we lived next to Detroit. And in 1967, when I was seven years old, the, the Detroit uprising, the riots erupted, and uh, my mom, in her great sensibility, when I was pestering her, why, why, why is this happening? She said, oh, this has to do with the fact that things are not fair in this city. And I knew, even at seven, what she meant, the, the gap between city and suburb, rich and poor, black and white. And that planted this little seed in my own understanding. And I really have just looked at the world through that lens of, of an inequality. Um, an interesting thing happened to me when I was about in my mid-20s. I had a job working with mobile home park tenants who owned their mobile homes but did not own the land in their parks. They didn't own their parks. And my job was to help them figure out how to buy their parks and own them as resident-owned cooperatives. And in the process of that, I got to know the intimate financial secrets of very, hundreds of, of low-income New Englanders, because I was the one who sat down with everybody in the park and said, what's your savings? What's your income? What can you afford to pay toward the purchase of the park? What can you afford to pay on a monthly basis? And it really gave me, uh, in the mid-'80s, a window into how people were struggling and surviving as real wages started to stagnate and flatten. Uh, and for those of you who were around in, the, in those days, you know, we really, between, you know, the end of World War II into the mid-70s, we really did live through a period of relative rising tide, lifting all boats. The bottom fifth, the middle, and the top all grew relatively, uh, saw their incomes grow at roughly the same rate. But starting in the late 70s and going into the 80s, real wages started to flatten out. So I had this intimate front row seat into how working people were struggling to survive in the growing unequal economy. But also growing up in a wealthy family, I had an intimate front row seat into the lives of my classmates, of my family and friends who would say things like, uh, you know, we, we bought that house up north 
for X and we just sold it for 30X and we bought another house. Or we're invested in a fund that's earning 30, 30 40% returns. And I sort of had this experience of like, seeing wealth creating wealth and what that meant in the lives of people I knew. And it ultimately led me to a, a, a radical decision because I worked with these mobile home tenants in some situations where to, to buy their parks, they had to come together and put every nickel they had together on the table. To, and, and, and there was something in, the, in that process of watching people exhibit an intense solidarity, a commitment to one another, a willingness to, to, to be all in for one another that inspired me. And in a way, I wanted what, what some of those people had. I wanted that sense of community and reciprocity. And I began to think that maybe this wealth that I had been uh, privileged to receive was an impediment or a barrier to me having the kind of authentic relationships of connection that I wanted. So I made this decision when I was 27 to, to give away the inheritance. And I, I won't talk much about that, but I can, I can later if people are interested. But that's just to give you an understanding that when, when I talk about these issues of inequality or when I talk about people in the 1%, I'm talking about people I love, people I know, people I respect, pe many people who I would want to be on my team to solve any civic problem. Um, so I don't hate wealthy people. I actually love some of them very dearly. Um, and I do think we are in a stuck place, and I want to talk about how to move forward. But first, let's just take a look now. What's the picture, 2019? What is the nature of the inequality that we're living with? Um, well, as I mentioned, for now over four decades, real wages, paychecks, have been flat. Half the population has not shared in the economic gains of the last 40 years. Uh, they've not shared in the productivity gains since the iPhone and the advent of the internet. And that means there's a lot of people who've left, been left behind and feel a deep sense of betrayal when it comes to looking around at the prosperity that others enjoy. But the other piece of the story, and that's sometimes left out, is what's happening at the top. There, really since the economic meltdown of 2008, most of the gains in income and wealth have gone not to the top 1%, but the top one-tenth of 1%. People in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 have incomes over 3 million, wealth over 20 million. Most of their income comes not from wages and salaries. More than half of it comes from owning wealth. The higher up we go up the economic ladder, the more concentrated the income and wealth becomes. Uh, the 400 wealthiest people in the United States, all billionaires, their combined wealth is equal to 64% of the population combined, the bottom 64. 400 billionaires, their combined wealth is equal to all the wealth owned by the, all the African Americans in the United States, plus a third of all the Latinos. 400 billionaires. And three billionaires, Bezos, Buffett, and Gates, their combined wealth is equal to the combined wealth of the bottom half of US households. I'm not making this up. The reason that's possible is because there are so many households that have so little. There are 21% of households are what I called part of underwater nation. They have zero or negative wealth. 21%, one out of five households, zero or negative wealth. 37% of African American households. 33% of Latino households. Zero or negative wealth. So that's how it's possible for three people to have as much wealth as the bottom 50% of US households. We have a extraordinary racial wealth divide, which actually has its own history and dynamics that really goes back to uh, the, 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 the ultimate disenfranchisement and, and you know, slavery, Jim Crow, separate but not equal, uh, the legacy of discrimination in wealth building and housing. Uh, so today, the median white family 
has 41 times the wealth of the, me of the median black family and 22 times the wealth of the median Latino family. So that's the picture. That's the picture today, 2019. But as Thomas Piketty said, if we don't intervene in the machinery now, the systemic inequalities that are uh, essentially keeping wages suppressed and funneling wealth to the top, that a generation from now, we will be a society, we will be a hereditary aristocracy of wealth where the sons and daughters of today's billionaires dominate our politics, our economy, philanthropy, and culture. You may be thinking, aren't we there already? But in fact, we will become more so. That if we don't intervene into these cycles of growing inequality, uh, we will become an economic and racial apartheid society that in my view, none of us will want to live in. Even those we might think of as the beneficiaries, the most wealthy people, will not want to live in the kind of polarized, calcified, and extremely unequal society that we will become. Do these inequalities matter? When I first started doing this work, people used to debate this point. People would say to me, well, I understand poverty matters, but does it matter how wealthy the wealthy are? I can now tell you, without taking much time, there's now a mountain of research, interdisciplinary research, in every area that shows that the concentration of wealth and power uh, is distorting and undermining everything we care about. It's bad for our health. It's bad for the health of the wealthy. It's bad for our democracy, clearly, when, when so few people have so much power it, it, in some ways, I think, explains the election that we lived through two years ago. When there's rising economic inequality and insecurity, it gives right, root to a regressive and progressive populism. So you see the anger and reflection of both, uh, you know, s support for Bernie Sanders and a focus here and Trump and the regressive populism. And regressive populism, why it's, it's, as old, it's the oldest story in the book. It's the history of when things become unequal and unstable, let us shift the focus. Let us scapegoat someone who has less power, less advantage. It's, it's the oldest story in the book. It's the, it's the roots and history of anti-Semitism uh, that deflect and blame. But that inequality is what underlies the condition of, of what we're going through. It, it, it has an effect on social cohesion. It supercharges the existing inequalities that exist in terms of gender and race uh, and, and other differences. It uh, stalls out social mobility. It, it keeps people in their castes with less mobility. It's even bad for the economy in so many ways. Sometimes I have friends who's, who are uh, entrepreneurs or business people and they say, you know, I worry about inequality, but I worry about some of the solutions that people are proposing because of the unintended consequences. It might hurt the economy. It might kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And I tell them about my friend Peter Georgesco, the retired CEO of Rubicon and Young, a big ad agency. He's a, he's a business leader who is outspoken on these issues of inequality. And Peter says to me, oh yeah, I have a lot of business leader friends of mine that say that too. What I tell them is extreme inequality is killing the goose. Extreme inequality is creating volatility, undermining prosperity, undermining healthy economic activity. Working people don't have money to participate in the economy. Uh, people are, are consuming based on net not on debt, not based on real wages going up. All those things contribute to negative economy. So what can we do about this? One important thing is to get the diagnosis right. There's been a big debate about inequality, what are the causes. Uh, there's a fairly large body of work that says inequality is a function of, of uh, 
of, of, of some people having the skills that they need to participate in the, in the new economy and others not. And that we are rewarding people who have high tech skills and, and can, uh, are engaging in the new economy. And the, the, therefore, if that's the diagnosis, uh, then the solution is investing in low wage workers, investing in education and training and moving uh, those workers up the wage ladder. But actually, I think it's, at this point, we're at a, in a new stage. That the, what's the, it, that the drivers, the drivers of these inequalities are, uh, and if I were to put it on a bumper sticker, it would be that the rules of the economy have been changed to benefit asset owners, wealth holders, at the expense of wage earners. The rules of the economy, tax policy, trade policy, um, you know, globalized trade policy, technological investments, uh, rules like ta uh, what government spends its money on, regulation, those rules, think of them almost as dials on the economy, uh, have been tilted to funnel wealth to the very top. If you understand the systemic drivers of inequality as uh, policy rooted, politically rooted, not a function of technological change, then you have a different set of solutions. You have a different prescription, prescription for fixing that. We can reverse these inequalities. We actually know quite a bit about how to do that. We know something from our own U.S. experience, because in the 30 years after World War II, as I mentioned, the rising tide more or less lifted all boats. In, uh, some of you maybe have heard a speech like this. Under the socialist presidency of Dwight Eisenhower, the wealthiest 1% paid three times as much income tax twice as much inheritance tax, and it was invested in public goods, infrastructure, debt-free higher education, loans for first-time homebuyers that built middle-class prosperity. You ever heard that? <laughs> so, we actually, as a society, tip the rules to build shared prosperity and build a middle class, largely a white middle class, in the years, decades after World War II. We also know other countries, other capitalist industrialized countries have significantly less inequality than the United States. How is that true? Well, like the Nordic countries or Canada, three things. They have a higher floor. They have a greater floor of decency, a social safety net, higher minimum wage, uh, universal health insurance, things that ensure that low-income people, people who lose their job, go through a divorce, have an illness, don't fall all the way to destitution. So they have less inequality because the floor is higher. But they also make investments in things that create social mobility and opportunity, and they pay attention to the growth and concentration of wealth at the top, and tax uh, high incomes and wealth at progressive levels and invest it in those public goods. So we also know from countries uh, that are operating across our border, not far away, what we can learn to reduce extreme inequality. So we know we need to raise the floor, well, the push, the move to raise the minimum wage, to expand health insurance to cover everyone, uh, to deal with issues around uh, family leave and health issues for workers, all these things that we can do to have a greater floor of decency. We know we have a long way to go to reverse the decline in social mobility. Uh, you may have heard the American dream move to Canada. The American dream, the idea that, uh, that uh, you should not have to be born wealthy to have a decent life in the United States, that, that uh, the American dream, so simple, that you work and you have health insurance, 
You work and maybe you can retire before you die. You can purchase a home. You can leave something for your children. It's a fairly simple dream. And yet, if you're not born wealthy and you want to have that American dream, you are better off living in Canada today where they make investments in early childhood education. They make investments in higher education so that people who are not born wealthy can have a decent life. <laughs> But we're not going to be able to reverse the inequalities we're living in just by raising the floor and just by making those investments because now we're living with a corrosive concentration of wealth and power. And so we have to do something to address the top. And mostly that brings us into the category of taxation. Although there's a very interesting uh, group of work happening around how do we expand worker ownership uh, how do we pre-distribute wealth by broadening the ownership of companies? Uh, and there's really interesting work, uh, and we know it has a huge impact. Some of you have, may have seen uh, the Chobani Yogurt CEO, who, who at a certain point uh, gave 10% of the company's stock to his most uh, committed employees, making some of them uh, millionaires overnight. Uh, but there's a whole move of organizing uh, private-owned companies owned by retiring baby boomers to sell those companies instead of selling them to private equity firms, sell them to the workers, work to broaden the wealth in that way. Co -op, cooperative ownership, worker ownership, different forms of, of sharing the wealth in the ownership and design of a company. Very important work, a lot of that work happening here in Oregon. But in terms of tax policy, we're going to have to do something something to address the concentration of wealth and power. And I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm enlivened by the debate in the last couple of months. There are some incredibly bold proposals some of the Democratic candidates for president have put forward. Um, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren proposed a wealth tax, an annual wealth tax on wealth over $50 million, a 2% tax, 3% on wealth over a billion would raise almost $3 trillion over a decade. Uh, Senator Sanders has a proposal to take the estate tax, our, our nation's inheritance tax, a levy on inherited wealth, and make it more progressive and close some of the loopholes that the wealthy have used to get around paying it. Uh, Representative uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is floated the idea of a new top tax rate uh, of 70% on incomes over $10 million. Uh, and Senator, or U.S. Representative Jan Chakowsky just introduced that proposal in Congress last week. So these are ideas that are not only will begin to, I, I call them the plutocracy prevention program, you know, <laughs> If you think of tax policy as an ecosystem, a little bit of a whack-a-mole game, you know, you can't just kind of tweak one tax here uh, because, boom, the wealth is going to move somewhere else. What happens, wealthy people will, you increase the income tax to 70%, they're going to turn their income into capital gains income and it's going to flow over here. So you need to have a proposal that addresses capital gains. You can't simply address income, we also have to address the wealth disparity. So the plutocracy prevention program really, by necessity, has a number of components. Uh, one of my favorite ideas is why not have a surcharge on incomes over $3 million, a 10% surcharge, basically falls only on the top one-tenth of 1%. 1 Again, would raise $70 uh, billion a year, 700,000 over uh, a decade, significant revenue that would be raised by those. So those are real proposals, and the good news is they're wildly popular. 70, 80 percent of voters support these ideas. A majority of Republicans support the idea of a uh, high income tax rate on incomes over 10 million. So you may be saying, well, well why aren't we moving forward? It's obvious, right? The, the national political system in the moment is captured by big money. It's captured by political donors who want to block these changes. Um, but the good news is there is 
a undercurrent, a realignment happening. People are waking up to the dangers of these inequalities and coming together and working in states and localities and cities to lay the groundwork and ultimately this will lead to a political realignment at the national level. No promises, no guarantees. Uh, things could still go very badly. You know what I mean? But on the other hand, there's you know, a whole generation of younger people who are pushing forward and pushing these ideas. I want to lift up what I think of as some of the most inspiring, game-changing campaigns that people are working on. Down the road in California, thousands of college students are coming together. They've organized something called the California College for All Coalition. Their big, bold idea is to restore the California estate tax paid by uh, people with wealth over five million, couples with 10 million or more, uh, will pay an estate tax that will raise over $4 billion for free higher education uh, in the community college, public state, and university systems in California. Again, these students are working hard. I work with a coalition of them at San Jose State. Uh, I've gotten to know a dozen of these students. Several of them live in their cars. Several of them don't know where they're going to get their next meal, but they are willing to organize and fight for college for all, and that will help not just them, but future generations of California restore California to its past glory as a tremendous public university system. Oregon, take note. We have a problem, which is that a huge amount of wealth is vanishing into offshore hidden wealth mechanisms. Where is all these trillions of dollars going? There's an estimated $10 trillion that the super wealthy, not just from the United States, but from around the world, is now hiding in offshore tax havens, trusts, shell corporations. Guess what? Some of that wealth is right here. It's being invested in luxury housing. It's buying land around the country. Uh, in the coastal cities, we're seeing uh, a glut of luxury housing that's being built, not for people to live in, but simply as wealth storage units. Global wealth is touching down from all over the world in the United States, in these cities, and activists in those cities are coming together to say, okay, in exchange for babysitting your wealth, we would like to levy a vacancy tax, uh, a real estate transfer tax, uh, a luxury real estate transfer tax, uh, requirements that beneficial owners uh, uh, disclose, you know, who, we know who's buying these properties. They want to make it as hard to buy uh, a luxury corporation, a luxury real estate with a shell corporation as it is to get a library card. Uh, in Boston, if I want to get a library card, I have to prove who I am and where I live. To create a shell corporation in Delaware and buy a luxury condominium, you don't have to do either. And so now we have you know, trillions of dollars of illicit funds, hidden wealth flowing into our economy, disrupting our local housing markets. Let's generate that revenue and direct it to permanently affordable housing in our communities. That is a big idea that's taking off in a number of coastal communities and is a great example of people acting where they have agency to reduce inequality. One of the challenges we're up against is not just these policies and the ideas and the power that it's going to take to change things, but the stories that we tell about inequality. You, you may have had this experience. You might tell somebody the facts, just as I told you about the concentration of wealth, and people say, well, that's troubling, but the people at the top deserve what they get, and the people who don't deserve to be where they are. Anybody heard that, had that, that kind of conversation? You know, the oil billionaire J. Paul Getty was once asked, how do you become wealthy in America? And he said, you know, it's really quite simple. There's three things you have to do. We can do a little poll here. One, get up early every morning. How many of you got up early this morning? <laughs> Two, work hard all day, including going to like a night lecture. <laughs> 
Three, find oil. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just as I thought. Bunch of... So people hear these statistics about inequality and they say, well, some people got up early. Some people worked hard all the day. Some people took risks. Some people are more creative and work harder. And there's sort of the shadow corollary. Other people didn't do that. In fact, if I were going to put the great mythology of, of deservedness on a bumper sticker, it's people are where they deserve to be. People who have a lot of wealth are virtuous. Let's be clear. These extreme levels of income and wealth inequality that we're living through have nothing to do with individual effort or deservedness. These are deeply systemic inequalities that are the result of rigged rules in the economy. Right? And yet, those powerful stories still persist. You may have noticed that data doesn't change people's minds, but powerful stories can resist all the data you provide. How do you do that? How do we change that? I have one clue. When I was involved in this campaign to defend the estate tax, uh, I got a call from Bill Gates up the road in Seattle, Bill Gates Sr., the father of the founder of Microsoft. And he said, let me, let me help this campaign to defend the estate tax. And he, true to his word, he, he, he went out and he helped organize and we got 1,500 multimillionaires and billionaires to step up and to defend the estate tax from repeal under George W. Bush. And in the process of that, we did these different press conferences around the country. And at one of the press conferences, we had a business leader named Martin Rothenberg stand up and speak. And he said, my name is Martin. I grew up in a community. My parents had no money. It was from working class community. Uh, but someday, but today, I'll have to pay the estate tax. I'm that wealthy. But when I was growing up, our family had very little. And yet, I went to a great public school. And I had science teachers that captured my imagination. And I went to a library that was open on the weekends and in the evenings. And that library became my sanctuary. And when I went to that library, there was this librarian who, for some reason, Martin says, took an interest in him. And she would say, Martin, I have a book for you. And she knew Martin was interested in science and technology, so it was a biography of a scientist or a book of experiments he could do in his apartment without burning it down. Martin says, my family had no money. Someone else paid for my education. Someone else paid for that librarian to be there. And then he went to college and he got a debt-free college education. Martin says, someone else paid for me to be able to go to college. And then he went to, uh, uh, into the field of emerging new technologies, the internet technology, a field that was largely built through public investments. And Martin said, you know, I started a company. And uh, at then one point, a foreign corporation stole my intellectual property was going to put me out of business. And the United States government went to my defense and sued to protect my intellectual property in a global tribunal, saving my company. He says, I didn't even know this infrastructure existed, but someone else paid to make it possible. So then Martin looks out at this press conference. He says, so last year I sold my company for $30 million. And I have several other companies worth the same amount. But what you're telling me is if you abolish the estate tax, you're basically saying I have no responsibility to pay back the society that made it almost entirely possible for me to get where I am. At this point, Martin starts to pound the podium. He says, I have a moral obligation to pay back so that some other young person out there who was born into the same humble circumstances as I could have the same opportunities I have. Because what a good society does is it recycles opportunity. 
And if you have the good fortune to have 10 million, 20 million, 50 million dollars or more, you didn't do it alone. Your wealth may come from your own efforts and partially your own applied gifts, but you operate in a society that created through public investments, a fertile ground that made your individual wealth possible. People like me, Martin says, should pay back the society so others can have the same opportunities we did. To me, that is the story that disrupts the I did it alone and I don't owe anybody anything story. It is the story of the web, public investments, family support, all the ways in which people get help. And so one of the things that I encourage people to do, wherever they are, is to try to lift up and tell true stories of how advantage works and demystify and disrupt the story of individual deservedness. <laughs> Let me close with a thought and then I look forward to your thoughts and questions. I've had this opportunity to go out and talk to some very wealthy audiences. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to talk to labor unions and student groups and workers. My message to my own peers, my own one percenters, if you will, is this. It's time to come home. It's time to come home and put your stake in the common wheel. Put your stake in a place and work to ensure that everybody's children have the same opportunities as your children. It's time for the wealthy to bring the wealth home, to bring it out of the offshore tax havens and the hidden global casino and bring it back to real, the real economy to local communities, to the new food systems and, 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 and new economy enterprises that employ and create real jobs, not fake, phony wealth. It's time to share the wealth and share generously through philanthropy, but recognize philanthropy is not a substitute for a progressive tax system and an adequately funded public sector. So pay your fair share of taxes. Stop using every loophole. Stop hiring lawyers and wealth defenders to game the system. Pay your fair share. Tell true stories of how advantage works. And recognize that you don't want to live in a society with an economic and racial apartheid pulling apart. It is in no one's interest, including you. And that's the message I took when I wrote Born on Third Base for a couple years, talking to groups of wealthy individuals. But my message to everyone else is it's time to get organized. It's time to defend our communities against this hyper-extractive capitalism that we're living through, that's hoovering up the wealth of nature, the wealth of workers, uh, the wealth of our communities. It's time to come together and organize. In that process, I want you to remember that there are some wealthy people who may be your potential allies. There are some unreachable wealthy. There are some hardcore cases that will not be uh, uh, on our side. There are people who use their wealth and power to rig the rules to get more wealth and power, but they are not the majority. There are lots of people waiting to be invited to something bigger and more meaningful than consumption. And they need to be invited home. You can invite them home to rejoin humanity. So that's part of my message, is we can find those allies and deploy them. You see, I know from my own experience Privilege is a disconnection drug. Privilege keeps people apart. When you grow up in the circumstances I did, you are buffered from real relationships of reciprocity and interdependence, and it creates a distance. The alternative, the antidote, is connection. 
is to being invited home. So think of people like me as your long-lost cousins who haven't been at the family reunion in 30 years or maybe a generation or two and invite us back to rejoin humanity, to roll up our sleeves, fight together, to protect the environment, to reduce and reverse these extreme inequalities. It is by no means too late. We can reverse the trajectory. We can change the stories that hold inequality in place. But we need to be together and to be bold. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down if you have a question. Oh, it's the accounting major. <laughs> Just in the last few years here in Eugene, our newspaper has been bought out by a national chain and our largest uh, broadcast TV stations. What uh, can we do as a local community to uh, make sure that the uh, dialogue and the narrative is what we want it to be? That's a good question. I think. Um, the, the concentration of media ownership reflects this concentration of wealth and power, and it's a limiting factor. Uh, but we still have some cracks and room to move. We still have local media that we need to lift up and support. Uh, independent radio is a really important medium in a lot of our communities. It's where a lot of conversations that aren't taking place in other places are happening. Um, independent uh, news organizations and revitalizing the Lyceum, the face-to-face -face forum, the opportunities for us to talk to one another. I think that's really important. I, I do think we do need to, you know, kind of revive, you know, FCC or, you know, the, the sort of the oversight of media concentration. We need to, just like all the antitrust issues, we need to create a countervailing uh, power to concentrated media power and try to, revive antitrust activity in this country as well. Oh, over here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your lecture. That was just incredibly Thanks. inspiring. Maybe we um, could raise the lights so we can see each other here. Um, I can see you. Yeah, I, I'm just really interested in hearing your thoughts on how, um, how wealth connects to the feeling of entitlement. Um, because this, this is a part of human psychology that I feel like I've wrestled with for as long as as long as I've been aware that there is great um, wealth inequality. Um, the question I had as a child was, what is the difference in your life between having six yachts and having seven? And I still don't understand it, but... Say but that again. What is the difference, right, in terms of, of your life, the quality of your life between having six yachts and seven? Um, although that smells like, that sounds like nothing when we're talking about the amount of wealth of the, the wealthiest of the wealthy, that would be a joke, right? Yeah. Um, but but so, so the point's even clearer, what's the difference, right, between a certain number of billions of dollars and one more billion dollars, right? right. Um, and for me, I wonder if it doesn't connect to something deep in human psychology that has to do with the feeling of entitlement, because I've noticed that whenever someone acquires a little bit more of something, whether it's money or privilege or power or position, it sort of feels right to them pretty mm. quickly. At first, they might be like, oh, wow, how surprising. And then suddenly they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it should have been that way. That feels right. But when you take something away, yeah. it doesn't feel right. And, and I think that there's something that goes on in people's minds when they have enough capital, that if that capital isn't functioning as capital by producing more capital, that they have this feeling of something being taken away, yeah. right? A kind yeah. of, and so I'm just curious to know if, is it enough that we work on our narratives is it enough that we work on our policies if we can't fix that or figure out how to address it, right? Good question. Uh, let me repeat it. No, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> um, the, uh, the first thing I would just say is we need a much more kind of robust and, and uh, less stigmatized conversation about how advantage works. So, you know, privilege is being kind of used sometimes as a cudgel, you know, people feel, oh, I'm not privileged, you know, and don't. but uh, just speaking for myself, you know, I, I gave away this money, but I had no clue how much other mountains of advantage I had, you know, at the age of 26. It's still, it's still unfolding in my own awareness, right? 
You know, I'm obviously four generations of economic stability creates a sort of uh, platform for wealth. Uh, well, uh, help family members help around struggles, mental illness, disability, addiction. Those things exist in wealthy families, but there's this support structure. Uh, obviously, I'm born white European, uh, male. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand the advantages that would be handed to me by virtue of the expectation that I should be in charge. You know, sort of this, um, I don't have to worry about my parents economically. That's a huge privilege. Uh, I, I worry about them, but I don't worry about them becoming destitute because they're economically advantaged. So there's 101 ways that advantages work for me. I think the, the way to begin is for us to try to re visit our own narratives, our own stories, and through the lens of what help did we get? What help did we get from family? So, uh, you know, white families uh, have the benefit of, you know, uh, after World War II, you know, public investments in first-time homebuyer loans and things that help white families build wealth and get on the, the wealth-building express train. My African-American, Latino, First Nations friends didn't have access to some of those wealth-building subsidies. So generations later, we're in really different places. How do we understand those, tell those stories, and, and, and put them on a sort of historical timeline and understand how advantage has worked for some people over time? Because the new physics of inequality is compounding advantage at the top and compounding disadvantage for everyone else. Um, and then this gets in, so then there's a certain process, and I think you said this, Carolyn, as, as people get more advantages, uh, there's a certain amount of amnesia sets in, or uh, willful denial, or, you know, so now you have people, well, you have like our president who says he's a self-made millionaire, or you have, you know, Brett Kavanaugh say, you know, I busted my tail to get into Yale, um, well, his grandfather went there too, so he's actually a legacy admission technically. You know, but what, you know, there sort of begins to be almost a, uh, a rewriting of one's own personal story, and the, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be harmful, except then the implication those people have is, well, you just need to do what I did. You need to just work hard like me and have your dad give you $413 million, million dollars, you know, or you need to work hard like me, you know, and so you mystify and you create a sort of aura of entitlement and deservedness around yourself and you judge others because they're not like you. So that's powerful stuff and I would just say there's a stigma around help and particularly I think we men hold that. It's harder for us to name the web of support that makes life possible, you know, I talk to these entrepreneurs and they say, yeah, I, d I didn't get any help. Uh, okay, so you were, did you have a mother? Did you, you were you raised, <laughs> raised, what about the wolves that raised you? Did they help you? You know, like, come, you, 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 did you go to a school? You know, was there anybody feeding you? You know, it was like, people kind of get locked into a narrative of, I did it myself, you know, and, and how do we relax that? Well, we just, destigmatize help. I got help. Uh, and, and you can understand why we have a stigma about help because think of how we treat people who need help in our society. You know? So I think, I don't know if that helps, but I'm, I think it gets, it gets at the underlying uh, issues that, that create that entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this question is kind of similar. My question is, have you given thought to why some wealthy people are like you and Martin and others are the hardcore wealthy, and just they're not going to budge. And how do you, people are in the middle, how do you nudge them? I think that, uh, you know, we're all gloriously different in how we're created. But um, I think part of it is, is asking people questions uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in an open-ended way, just like, just like I said. Did you, what help did you get? Who were, the, who were the people? Were there coaches and mentors and people who, who supported you? Were there public investments? Did you get any help 
from the government. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, I, I was invited to the retired men's club of Norwood, Massachusetts a couple years ago. Uh, you know, 150 men, all European heritage. And I said, I'm just curious, how many of you got a debt-free college education after World War II? Three-fourths of the men in the room raised their hand. I said, how many of you got uh, help with your first uh, home mortgage? You know, a, one, a farmer's home or veterans administration or FHA mortgage insurance? Three-fourths of the men in the room raised their hand. I said, how many of you think that was a, those were a waste of government money? <laughs> Everybody laughed, you know, they were like, no, that was, that one guy said, that was the magic carpet to the middle class, you know? And I said, well, I'm just curious, how many of you are helping your children make it in today's economy? And uh, they all raised their hand. We're all helping our kids. We're all helping our grandchildren. One guy says, I'm the, the parental down payment assistance program. You know? <laughs> I'm the grandpa ATM. You know, we are helping our kids. I said, well, think about this. Your children and grandchildren, do they know that you are the beneficiary of a major government subsidy for that home ownership, for that education? And um, they all laughed. They said, no, nobody talks about that. We don't talk about it. No one asks us. Well, that's a pretty important piece of the story. Um, I think my theory, though, is it has a little bit to do with um, the role of shame in our culture. We just tend to shame people who need help, ask for help, and, and so we try to forget the ways we got help and we tend to over-focus on our own individual role in whatever got us to where we are. And I think um, I would just welcome people to see the web. And, and uh, it, it's liberating. Uh, it's like the matrix, you know, whoosh, it appears. The, the matrix of commonwealth that makes life possible. Um, yeah. I have a difficult question. Um, I'm a big fan of your affiliation with Post Carbon Institute in Corvallis, which talks about limits to growth on a finite planet. Uh, one of the problems that makes inequality even more difficult is we've reached the physical limits to growth. And I think some of the zillionaires understand it, which is why they're imposing a neo-feudalist, uh, hmm. grabbing everything rather than seeing their commonality as part of the 100%. So I assume you're familiar with Richard Heinberg's The, end, the Limits to Growth, uh, The End of Growth book, sorry. Uh, could you just discuss how we can deal, how can, how, how can we deal with sharing a smaller and shrinking economic pie? I guess that's the way to summarize it. Yeah. What a great question. So uh, another way to phrase it is, you know, I've been talking about inequality, but how do we think about this in relation to the ecological and climate challenges that, that we're living through right now? Um, and I still encounter a lot of people when it comes to how do we fix inequality who uh, go back to the famous George W. Bush uh, notion that what we need to do is make the pie higher. <laughs> uh, we just need to grow the pie and carve it up in a more equitable way, and that's how we're gonna reduce inequality. And in fact, that was kind of the playbook after World War II. Uh, we, you know, ginned up the economic growth machine, largely fueled by fossil fuels, and uh, we extracted and burned and consumed and dumped, and, but that was part of this growth engine that brought the kind of prosperity to, well, so, that playbook is no longer available to us. We are gonna to have to figure out how to reduce extreme inequality on a finite planet. Uh, at the same time, my friends, and, and you should check out the Post Carbon Institute. It's a great organization. I was just in Corvallis meeting, meeting with folks from there. Um, the, 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 there are people in the ecological movement who say, we don't really have time to address these inequality issues, you know, because we, we have a limited time. My view is we're actually not going to be able to address the ecological crisis unless we address the underlying extreme inequalities and the insecurities that most of the people on the world feel. Uh, we, we can't. So we really, and that's where like the idea, the proposals like the Green New Deal are so important because we need to put a price on carbon. We need to figure out ways to 
you know, clamp down on emissions, and we need to invest in building healthy, resilient, vibrant economies and that are more equitable and good jobs. And we have to address the concentration of wealth in that context and build a new economy that lives within the limits of the earth. So uh, I think they're, they're absolutely integral and uh, I would in invite you to check out the Post Carbon Institute and their work because it's, I think it's the, a, a vital piece of how we're gonna move forward. Yeah. Hello, so I'm a graduate student here studying nonprofit management and so the world that I move in is kind of dictated by philanthropy and you briefly touched on on that topic, but the more that I am kind of enmeshed in that world, I get more and more distressed at how um, such a small group of people control so much, and also they're only legally obligated to give away a, a very small percentage of what they put into these foundations, for private foundations. And so I just wonder if you have any ideas about whether or not we should be changing that, and what do you think the future is for more equitable philanthropy? Yeah, it's a great question about, uh, here's somebody who's working in public policy and management and is looking at philanthropy and is more and more troubled by uh, what I would call top-heavy philanthropy. So, uh, and actually, uh, I was in a class today here on campus uh, uh, in the 3 p.m. department, now I'm getting to know the logo here, um, to talk about philanthropy. Let me, a couple of important points. One. The framework, that the modern framework of, of philanthropy and charitable giving that creates private foundations was, cre was created 50 years ago in 1969 at a period of maybe the greatest relative equality in the United States history. 50 years later, we're now in this period of extreme inequality. And so it's completely warped and distorted philanthropy. Uh, our vibrant, independent sector, which depends on charitable donations, is more and more supported by a smaller number of wealthy donors. Giving by low and middle income givers has been steadily going down over the last two decades. Almost all the growth in philanthropy has been the mega gifts, the, the $100 million gifts, the $200 million gifts, the, the gifts by the very wealthy. So. The growth of giving is always is being touted as a great development, but it's masking this underlying problem. And part of the problem is philanthropy sort of has this virtuous glow about it, and for good reason. It's, it's a reflection of our generous impulse. It's, you know, uh, it's people sharing and giving. They're giving to the common good as opposed to just buying another yacht, so we are supposed to have a warm, fuzzy feeling about it when it happens. But the problem is it's now becoming an extension of private power. So I'm worried about the growth of what I would call billionaire beneficence, billionaire philanthropy. Um, and here's the reason why. It is in our, it is, it, it's important to remember for every dollar that a billionaire gives to charity, the rest of us as taxpayers chip in somewhere between 37 and 60 cents on that dollar in lost tax revenue. Meaning we are kind of uh, mat providing the matching gift to the billionaire. So if the billionaire wants to build a, you know, a building with their name on it or they want to you know, subsidize a wing of an art gallery, uh, we are providing matching funds for that effectively. We're picking up the slack by paying for defense and national parks and infrastructure because they're not paying tax dollars. So we have a public interest, a legitimate public interest in providing rigorous oversight to the philanthropic system and make sure it, it's delivering as promised. And I think we're now at the point where we need to revisit the rules, the framework that governs philanthropy and tune it up a bit to ensure that the money continues to flow, that it's not warehousing in private foundations or donor advised funds, that low and middle income givers have the incentives to also give and be rewarded, uh, that wealthy people aren't using charitable institutions as another tax dodge, uh, and to protect democracy f 
from wealthy billionaires using philanthropy as and weaponizing philanthropy to advance a narrow self-interested agenda. So it's time to reform philanthropy um, for the sake of democracy as well as the sake of the independent sector which is so important in our society. Yeah. I was going to ask you about a book called The Win, I think it's called Win Win. It's the Aspen Institute guy who wrote the book. Are you aware of that? Winners Take All. Winners Take All. Yeah. Um, where these rich people won't invest unless they can also win. So if they can change, make a big change in society, they won't do it unless they can get money back. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, he's talking about a terrific book by Anand Giraharadas called Winners Take All, the elite charity, the, the elite charade uh, of fixing the world. And uh, I highly recommend it, uh, or, or I recommend listening to a talk that he's given. And, and he's basically talking about what we just talked about, this, the rise of, of uh, top-heavy philanthropy, the power of these donors to shape uh, the agendas around us, uh, the pressures that they put on universities and other nonprofit institutions to sort of move their mission in certain directions, uh, and what's not funded, what's not talked about. Uh, and and uh, Anand has a funny point, he says, you know, the, the, the billionaires want to address inequality. They want to address poverty, but they don't want to, that, but there's two topics that are off the table for their funding and philanthropy and that they don't want to be, have in the discussion. One is taxes. The second is labor rights and worker rights. So let's try to, we, it's great, just, we can fix inequality, but let's not raise taxes or give workers any more power. Okay, that's, their, that's the deal that they're making. And so they're using philanthropy to kind of narrow the discussion. And they'll, so you'll see all these groups that are running around, you know, we're gonna reduce in, inequality through impact investing. You know, so we're gonna move, you know, which is, there's elements of impact investing that are really great. Uh, impact investing is sort of the, using your investment capital to, for social good. Uh, you know, it means about as much as natural food, right? And impact investing, you know, it's, it, it, but you know, so some of it's really good, some of it's really healthy for you, some of it's not so good, right? Um, but that's, that's, you know, so there's 101 other solutions other than talking about taxes. That's why it's so interesting that the, the Dutch historian who was at Davos, you know, uh, you know at, at the meeting with the wealthiest uh, people on the planet, you know, 1,500 private jets come in and they're all sitting around and he says, all you talk about is philanthropy. We should be talking about taxes, taxes, taxes. You know, he was sort of essentially pointing out the elephant in the room. So I think that's, that, you know, I, I, I think Anad has really got an important point. And that's why I'm here talking to you about taxes. Because you're not going to hear it from half the other groups that are funded to work on inequality. <laughs> just, just real quickly, yeah. I worked at the Pebble Beach Resort for 11 years as a bus driver. And uh, a lot of the white males, they were really abusive, really toxic, and uh, threatened to beat the crap out of us, all kinds of stuff. And uh, so I don't know what you do about, they treat us like subhumans, and I don't know what you do about that class of wealthy people who've, who won't recognize us as real humans and that th they think that mistreating us makes them real men. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I don't have an answer except for the, the em empathy deficit is obvious here. Yeah. Um, just uh, one, one comment and then one question. I really appreciated what you said about sort of predatory philanthropy. There were, we had a speaker last week talking about uh, some of that taking place here. The book, he wrote a book called The University of Nike, which is, I recommend that to all the audience. But um, yeah. the question I had was you hinted at in your talk a transition in the late 20th century from business being oriented around um, paying good wages, helping their employees, but also making a profit. And now my understanding of business is more about a bottom line for investors who are not the employees of the company generally. When, when did that transition take place? And, and if, it's, if it is really a transition that took place, is it the decline of unions? Or mm -hmm. I just didn't know if you had yeah. any comments on that. Uh, question is really, when did the transition take place between uh, you know, sort of a more uh, less, uh, I guess, extractive form of capitalism 
and, and the present. And, and um, you know, there was this, I guess I would call it a brief 30, 40 year period, you know, as a result of the New Deal, there, were a, there was a new framework set, a new social contract between uh, business and community, business and workers, largely enforced by organized labor. So, you know, in the mid-1950s, one out of three workers was in a union. And the other workers who weren't in unions benefited from the fact that workers had this clout in the society, so, you know, they could say, in, you know, if, if, if the economy's growing, if productivity's increasing, we want a piece of the pie. Yeah. And now we're at a point where, you know, less than 10% of the private sector workers are in a union, um, and that's a, a huge power imbalance. So that was clearly part of it. Part of it was sort of the changes in the global economy, uh, come in, you know, in the 70s and the kind of corporations kind of restructuring to, to go lean and mean. And, uh, and you know, one, one thing I think it's important to real, uh, say is, you know, there are many flavors of capitalism. There's now a rigorous debate about capitalism versus socialism, and, and I'm not sure we sort of have the, 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 the labels down here. You know, I think there's sort of a spectrum. There's many flavors of how to organize economies. You know, there's, you know, the Nordic countries. These are capitalist societies, but they're social democratic or, or democratic capitalist societies where less inequality, more of the commons is sort of nailed down. And then the United States, we're living in this hyper-extractive capitalism where, you know, we're, we're squeezing every nickel, every ounce of nature, you know, in, in a sort of take the money and run you know, power grab. Yeah. You know, but, and then there's all kinds of op options in between, you know, Canadian and England and the, the Western European and, you know, so there's, you know, I, I think it's just helpful to like say, we're, you know, the Nordic countries are vibrant private market societies. They're not, you know, Stalinist state socialism. They're, they are private market societies that have, they're, they're almost like completely rewired capitalism compared to the United States, I mean, to the point where we, you know, it, it probably should have its own name. Yeah. So what, what we do know is, that, well, the next system, we need to create a different, better system that has less inequality, that lives within the boundaries, constraints of Earth, uh, that uh, um, broadens wealth and opportunity, um, that strength, you know, that's built on strong local economies. We know the components, uh, and we know that extreme inequality kind of disrupts our ability to move in that direction. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Really inspiring uh, lecture. Um, Thanks. My question is um, it's a common argument to hear that while we live in such a stratified, an astonishing, astonishingly stratified um, country in the United States, that we still have it better than in the other developing countries, or um, the poorest of us are still in better conditions than other places. I mean, I disagree with the argument, but what do you say to that? Well, that's, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's clear that happiness and well-being has a material basis. You know, if you, if you have access to stable shelter, health care, you know, food, uh, and you've reached a certain level plateau of security, you were better off. We know that above a certain amount, the, the, the happiness, you know, as wealth climbs, we don't necessarily become happier. One of the things that makes me a little nervous about those comparisons is people say this, so, you know, these, these people only live on $2 a day. But what they have is a much more robust commons. They have much more robust uh, self-provisioning networks. They're not purchasing all their needs through a market economy. They're growing some of their own food. They're meeting their needs. There are more healthy gift economies and barter and exchange societies. So. There are many ways in which we in the United States are better off and, and wouldn't want to trade positions with people in some parts of the world, but there are other ways we're impoverished 
because we don't have the sort of kinship networks or the gift economies or the, or the uh, sort of commons-based economies. And uh, so I think it's hard to, hard to, to, to compare those. Um, so I would, I would just not make statements like, oh, we're, we're so much better off than people in these other parts of the world because we have a lot to learn even from uh, so, you know, societies in, that, that appear to have very, very little in terms of material wealth. Maybe one more question and then we can, yeah. You've got the last spot. Ooh. Your last call, yeah. <laughs> um, so given that a lot of these, these inequalities arose from systemic problems with policy, how do you convince people to give more money to the government that already created the issues in the beginning, especially in a climate of distrust? Yeah, a huge barrier to uh, taxation is how people feel about government, that there's no surprise there, uh, and the need to rebuild trust in government. But we have, you know, I think one, ha one challenge is we don't really have positive PR for the positive things that government does. There's a lot of things that local government does that people broadly support. The more sort of closeness to people's lives, the better. People, have, people feel better about their state governments. When it gets to the national government, that's where things really break down, and that's also where the power imbalances and distortions kick in, so you have this enormous focus on militarization and military budget, and you know, the, the power of lobbyists to shape public priorities basically disenfranchises the rest of us. But I think the way to move forward are, I call them these game-changing campaigns. A game-changing campaign would reduce the concentration of wealth and power, generate revenue for something big and bold that will make a real difference in people's lives, comes with a constituency willing to fight for it, and uh, changes the narrative or the story around inequality. So I mentioned the students in California uh, but in Massachusetts, we have a, a millionaire tax initiative. Uh, it would re raise income taxes on incomes over a million dollars. It would generate money for education and, and public transportation. So there's a constituency that's going to fight for it. Uh, and it uh, changes the story about, you know, the, we, we're, we're enlisting, just like in California, people who, business leaders who who support public transit, uh, graduates from college in the 60s and 70s who got a debt-free college education and are standing up to say the next generations of students should get that. So I think part of how you, we re rebuild government is through a little bit of earmarking, is through a little bit of linking to big things that matter. Debt-free higher education? Yeah, you got a constituency of students and their parents. 40 million households in the United States are carrying some form of student debt. That's a political constituency. Uh, the Green New Deal, people who care about the environment and, the, and, our, and green, green New Job Opportunity, that's a constituency uh, that would, you know, um, make things happen. So I think we need to do things that, you know, we, we forget we together through government can do big and bold powerful things together that will really make the quality of our lives better, uh, that's, 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 that's the hope. And, uh, you know, the attack on government, the attack on the tax system, the undermining of the IRS, all these things are an effort to sort of weaken and undermine that. So that's, that's part of our civic job is to reverse that. So, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> Thank you for coming out, and I just want to mention um, I co-edited a newsletter called inequality.org. It comes out every Monday that is really about uh, things that we can do together, inspiring stories of people working on these issues of inequality. So you can just go on there and sign up, but I also have a clipboard if you're interested and want to sign up for this weekly newsletter. I'll have it out by the book table, I guess. <laughs>